welcome everyone to uh, Friday Talks with Society uh, 2045. We started these talks uh, a while ago and they're kind of accumulating now in a, in a very positive way, uh, essentially to, to talk with people who are thinking about the future and uh, to be able to record and share the ideas for the kind of world that we might like to be living in in 2045. Today, uh, our special guest is Rick Smyer, who is a very noted futurist, and it's a pleasure to have him here. And Rick, why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about um, your background and how you got to the point where you are today. Stuart, let's see, where do I want to start? Well, my background is uh, my grandson is the sixth generation of our family in Gastonia in North Carolina, which is 20 miles due west of Charlotte. I went to uh, college at Davidson. If you're a basketball fan, <laughs> every, four, every 40 years, we will get into the top eight or four in the, in the nation, Steph Curry. Uh, I graduated there in 1964, went to NC State for another four years. So I was, uh, and then I went to, Viet, uh, to the Army for two years in Vietnam and came back and thought I was going to spend the rest of my life uh, managing a, a family-controlled textile firm of a thousand people. And as I, that was in 1971 when I came back. And in 1973, the whole concept of business and, and the way in which uh, the textile industry uh, was evolving and moving overseas created in me uh, an understanding that I better rethink what I'd been taught in eight years of college. One of the hardest things for me to do was to get outside the framework of thinking that I had the answers. And, and as I began to realize that uh, I didn't know what the appropriate questions were, then at the age of 50 to 52, after being chairman of the school board and our local community and chairman of the, uh, of the uh, Chamber of Commerce and our local community and various state roles and otherwise, I began to, to understand, I better ask some new questions. I really wasn't open to listening to things. I was very strong in my opinions. And I had the truth, so therefore I wasn't able to resonate with questions that came up that were different than what I already thought. Around my work then for the last, oh you know, gosh, 20, 32, 33 years, I guess, as a futurist, has been to work with wonderful people like Stuart and others across the world, US, Canada, and the world, to try to rethink what's happening in this time of transition of not just culture, but our historical transition as we move from the industrial age to whatever you want to call it. Uh, I have a good friend who's 96, uh, John Cobb out in California, who if you Google John, it comes up one of the two most preeminent theologians and philosophers of the 20th century. And John's just a wonderful human being. And we have a group that he recruited and I was, he was nice enough to ask me to be one of them. And we're in a dialogue about how do you, how do you build capacities for transformation? How do you see new ways of thinking? How do you get people to collaborate at a deeper level? How do you identify emerging trends and weak signals before they become trends? And, uh, and we were the first ones to begin to think about uh, the whole idea of transformation as opposed to reforming change. Rick, if I could just interrupt for one second, because I'd love you to drill down. You, sure. used some, you used a couple of key words that I know are, are, are so important in your work. You know, transformational leadership, weak signals. And I know that you've been involved um, in your thinking in terms of community development, you know, economic and otherwise. Could you drill down into those, those concepts in terms of your vision for the future? Sure, Stuart. Let me just take uh, the, the concept of uh, transformation. And I was mentioned Elena Hitolton. And it was 1997 when I got in touch with her and she's over in Finland. 
because we were beginning to use that term transformation at the World Future Society conference. We make a distinction between reforming change and transforming change. And reforming change is when you take an idea or, an, or a process or a concept that's been around for years and you improve it, you enhance it, you make it more effective. But you don't challenge the underlying assumption of the idea itself. Transformation is when you really rethink, whether it's in education or economic development. I served on the staff of the and we introduced and laid the base for the concept of economic development, transforming into a more connective entrepreneurial type of economy, as opposed to the large businesses that Vincent's our firm and others are. So transformation is a key part of all of our work, Stuart. And, and then in terms of, of thinking about master capacity builder, that we make a distinction between two types of leaders. One is a traditional type of leader that I was, I was until about 20 years ago. And uh, based on strategic planning, based on identifying the outcomes before you start the processes, and that you in effect then reach that goal and, and set it up so you can, you can efficiently move to the, at the lowest cost possible to meeting that goal. And so, that the very nature of transformation and weak signals in become a key part of our work with the idea in mind that you have to lay the seeds with people like you and collaborate with others throughout the world from my point, from my case, to be able to build these new capacities that you don't know necessarily whether they're gonna work or not. And I'll give you a quick story. I was, oh, I was asked to go over to Edinburgh, Scotland back in 2000 to spend a week over in Scotland. And uh, one of the people that I, that I got to know uh, with a two hour conversation, he became a friend and is a friend to this day, is a guy named Harry McMillan who was head of British Petroleum for Scotland. And the three of us were just sitting around talking. And uh, Harry would, uh, Harry brought up the fact that uh, British Petroleum had just had in London, and this was in 99, uh, that had their board meeting and they weren't gonna, weren't gonna strategically plan anymore. And I did a double take. I said, Harry, wait a minute. What do you mean you're not gonna strategically plan anymore? Wasn't BP and Gulf or Ramco and Shell the ones in the early, in the 40s and 50s to look out 50 years and even lay the base for the whole concept of strategic planning? And he could have answered my question he wanted me to learn to think differently. And so he said, he asked me a question, he said, Rick, what are the two assumptions of strategic planning? And I, that was my background. So I thought a moment and I said, well, Harry, I guess one of them is that you can identify the outcome. And he said, that's right. And he said, what's the other one? And I thought a minute and I didn't get it. Once he said it, I thought to myself, duh, that's not obvious. He said that you can control the processes from where you are to where you want to go. And he said, we are in dialogue with, with leaders in Nigeria and it's politically unstable and we don't know how we're going to be able to uh, work in collaboration with those, with the business leaders in Nigeria. And he said, and we're beginning to work with China on what they call 3D seismic technology. It's now called horizontal drilling. And he said, we don't know whether that's going to work or not. And so what Harry in his indirect way, Stuart, was getting me to think about was how to think differently. And I was just rolling my, what, what Harry was saying in my head. And that's when I came up with the concept of transformational learning. And, trans, and, and a lot of these concepts of transformation. Because what he was saying was the old traditional ways aren't gonna work. We're gonna have to challenge the underlying assumptions with which we work. So I took that principle and I began to think about, well, if we take education, how is it gonna to transform to be able to deal with a world that's increasingly fast-paced, interdependent, interconnected, and complex? And it's going to be very different in dealing with that kind of world than it's going to be of what we've done in the past. 
So, so I then began to work with good people like you and 75% of my leadership style now is to ask appropriate questions and to get to thinking of other people and then see what connections can be made so that transformative ideas can emerge from what we call now a futures generative dialogue because it's focused within the thinking of an emergent future that isn't fully defined yet. It's generative in the sense that we're not stating people what we think, we're asking questions. And it's a dialogue as opposed to a discussion. And so I had to change a lot to be able really to put myself in a position where I would hear what other people were saying. So I was trying to incorporate. Great. So say a little bit more about, and I know you use this term and you think it's important, the, the notion of weak signals. What does that mean to you in terms of building the future? Let me define it and then I'll give you a couple of examples. A weak signal is that which is just beginning to appear, no matter in what part of society. It's just beginning to appear and that very few people know about it and you don't know whether this new and emerging idea is gonna have validity to it or gonna be important. And yet, when you begin to shift your thinking, as I began to see that, that I wasn't asking the right questions, Stuart, that I was asking questions based on a traditional approach to thinking about the future or the present even. And so I began to collaborate with different people and began to think about things in a different way and we would connect and collaborate. And one of the reasons was because in looking at the last 250 years, that the way in which then the basic set of ideas that emerge out of the Renaissance, the Reformation and then the Renaissance, then led to what I call one factor thinking and linear processes, obviously. As you got outside the control of the kings, then in turn, the ability to get beyond either or thinking was one of the challenges that I had because I now understand that when I would frame a question in a way that required the person to only have one particular idea and it was either or, and if I disagreed with it, then I would challenge that person. So we would waste a lot of time because usually each one of us had bits and pieces of probably what was emerging, but we really weren't listening to each other because we were trying to, in effect, convince each other of our point of view. And so I began to collaborate with so many other people to develop the concept of how do you ask an appropriate question? And therefore that's where we came up with the concept of transformation many years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a term that been, had been used before that, obviously. But the way in which we then began to use it was different in the way we applied it and built capacities for transforming whatever it was, an organization, ourselves, a society, didn't matter what. So what I hear you saying is that at some fundamental level in terms of leadership, that um, the critical change will be um, people thinking differently and, and, and acting differently. So given, given that, um, if you project into the future, how would you see um, society organized in, in, in some different ways, communities organized in some uh, different ways, uh, business organized in some different ways? What, what, what changes would you like to see between now and some point 25 years down the road from now? That's a very insightful question, Stuart, and it has no easy answer to it. So let me approach it from one or from a couple of ways. Uh, since we, we conceived the idea about 20 years ago of adaptive planning, and with strategic planning, you have, or, or you think you have, a knowledge of what the outcome will be. And in adaptive planning, you use the call, what is called complex adaptive systems. And that you look ahead, but you don't predict the outcome because really in this day and time, with things that are so interdependent and complex and moving so fast, 
you're lucky to know what's going to happen three and four and five years out. So I don't ever get caught up in looking ahead in a specific way of trying to determine with a lot of certainty what is going to happen 15 years from now or, or 20 years from now. I have a sense the weak signals will give you a sense of some of the ideas that are emerging. And you can go back 30 years like 3D printing that, that people know today. You go back to 3D printing 30 years ago in the late 80s or the idea of the concept of the web. And a lot of people think the web is a concept that came about in the, and that's the graphical interface of the internet. But the web didn't come about until Tim's, Benner, Tim's Bernard Lahr came up with the concept. And of course he gave it away. I was gonna say, so what are some of the weak signals that, that you're seeing today? Well, one of the weak signals I'm seeing today is, I'll start off from a human standpoint. And especially those of us that are older, that if they, and this was my metamorphosis, if they begin to be open, truly open to new ways of thinking and ask questions, they don't spend so much time as I used to do, which is a waste of time now, in my opinion, about myself, of trying to convince people that I, that I was right, whatever it was. So some of the weak signals are the way in which society is going to be organized, in my opinion, uh, that will be more of a, uh, we coined the term meta ecosystem, uh, and, and our community of the future network is evolving with different people in the United States and other countries, uh, three parallel processes. And this goes back to your question. And so one of the processes is in parallel is develop a uh, set of, of books and manuscripts that are all focused on transformation, whether it be transformation of education, transformation of economic development, of leadership, or whatever it is. And then we already have, uh, to include you, as you know, uh, 23 people that have, in effect, not only written articles, but have been interviewed and uh, with a fellow up in Kentucky uh, that puts all of his work on YouTube. And now what we're doing is we're in the early stages of building connections among people, ideas, and processes to build an ecosystem of people in the U.S. and Canada to start with, but I'm also doing it with a colleague in Australia. And so one of the weak signals is the reorient, reorient, reorienting then the way we connect with each other, getting away from radical individualism to help, to help collaborate, and you're an excellent collaborator yourself, and then begin to think about how do we then look to organize communities in ways that aren't just self-limiting to a local community, but have different individuals in the communities that are also connected in webs and ecosystems and then meta ecosystems when you combine ecosystems to begin to have new ideas filtered into the thinking of different people at the local level or wherever it is, my interest is at the local level. So those are weak signals and then then there are a couple of other weak signals I'll mention, in my opinion. And who knows whether they'll come to fruition or not. But I think one of the keys to the way in which leadership is going to be done in the future is for people to connect their own individual capacities, learn to listen, and by listening, see connections they wouldn't have seen otherwise because of a future's context. So when an individual begins to get interested in thinking about the future, not just extrapolating the past as if the past was gonna be extrapolated in the future, but saying, what are those key ideas that are emerging that are very different from the past, whether it be in technology or whether it be in education or even the concept of how we as individuals connect with one another. And so those weak signals are emerging and evolving in a very complex, fast paced way and what we're doing then in working with master capacity builders is help to coach them in how to build these connections as they begin to emerge, not worrying about an outcome, that the outcome will then emerge as you bring people, ideas, and processes together. So 
what I'm hearing once again, you know, is um, people acting differently in how they interact um, with each other. And this concept of emergence, rather than uh, thinking you know uh, how things are. And, and these are, I think, critical foundational principles for um, human interaction. So what I'd, what I'd like to do for a few minutes is um, see what kind of questions uh, folks have. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd yeah. love to di dig in. Uh, thank you so much for that, Rick. So, so my, I, I have too many questions, but I'll start with one. <laughs> um, I love the, the concept of transformation. Um, and I love the idea that uh, part of the problem is we're asking the wrong questions um, uh, and, and or we're framing things in the wrong way uh, or has, have historically done so. How do you see this transformation that you've just described impacting both the, the way we govern as, <laughs> as a nation or, or as the set of nations, um, but also how does it change the way uh, we govern organizations within that nation state model that we currently have? And, 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 and do you see the change, the transformation that will happen there in those two worlds uh, being consistent or are, are they going to continue to diverge as they have? Jose, do you have about four hours that we can have a dialogue together? <laughs> I've just sent you a LinkedIn invite, so yes. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, And I don't take myself seriously, and I don't have the answers as I thought I had for years, okay? With all that said, uh, yeah, there's a chapter in the book that Neil Richardson, who was the deputy chief of staff, he's a dear friend, he's 20 years younger, up in Washington, D.C., and Neil and I wrote a book about five years ago a niche book that was called uh, Preparing for a World That Doesn't Exist Dash Yet. And one of the chapters is on what we call mobile collaborative governance. And the idea is that the very nature of the way we govern ourselves, I think is in a stage of transition. And I hope we're able to move to the next level or the next maybe as opposed to level. We, we work in concentric circles, so to speak. To, to get away from this idea of hierarchy, both the hierarchy of thought and hierarchy of control of others. And I think we're in this transition time period. I have been a heretic about the idea of representative democracy for years. I'm a great supporter of democracy and a great supporter of the way in which uh, uh, the, the powers that be in the sense of how a society is organized and operates needs to be inclusive as much as possible. And we have a number of challenges that relate today. One is the, the cumbersomeness and inefficiency of the system that was designed 200 years ago for our present age, in my opinion, okay? And one of the other aspects of this is a new type of leadership. I believe that we're going to have to develop processes at all levels, but especially the local level, that will allow individuals to involve themselves with their own ideas and opinions by surveying. We did something in our own county, and I don't know if it's ever been done anywhere else, 35 years ago, Jose, that was called the Gaston Community Forum. And what we did was <clears throat> we, we have six townships in our county. And those townships then have varying different populations distributed in each township. And so we had a concept that was spun out of the Chamber of Commerce called Look Up Gaston. And we then developed a board represented all the major organizations in the county. And they ended up being something like 39 people on the board representing uh, 36 or 37 or 36 organizations. And one of the things that we did was to in effect determine that 
since we were a textual community, and I don't know if you know anything about a textual community, but it's a very top down, even more so than, even more so than naturally our society has been up until this point in time. And so, so many of the individuals that worked in the textile plants felt like that they, their lives were being controlled. And so our, our generation that came along wanted to, in effect, rethink how we would, in effect, create an environment in our county where citizens could feel that they were having an impact on the thinking of the decisions that were being made. So we conceived this idea and, and what we did was, and forgive me for going on like this, but that's why I said, do you have four hours? Uh, no, I'm not gonna talk for four hours. So, please. <laughs> so, so at any event, so we realized that we had to, to not only find a way to deal with more complex issues, but to do it in a way that got the input from citizens. And this was before the advent of the personal computer in the mid eighties when we did this. So we ended up having township chair people and then they would choose area chair people. Our board would come up with a number of people for each area and then they would just choose. So notice the decentralizing effect here. And then the, the area chair people, I mean, the, the uh, yeah, the area chair people would pick neighborhood chair people. And we ended up having 365 people that twice a year would hand out surveys with, with instructions and a sheet of information about trending, future trending of that idea, whether it be an economic development or governance or whatever it would be. And so we, we had then 1,800 people that were surveyed twice a year on different issues. You want to make a guess? And you, you probably know the percentage if you send it out over the internet, what percentage you expect to get back. But you want to make a guess as to what percentage of the, uh, of the questionnaires we got back that were, that were I'd, I'd guess 68%. Well, 68%, you're, you're, you're very close. Most people will say five to 10% because they're putting it in the context, you know, of, of the way in which, uh, he, uh, so say any event, we got back 91, 81% the first time and never below 59% in three years. And the only reason I bring this up based on your question, I hope you've made the connection already with me going through this, is that I have come to believe both using technology and, and connecting it with personal interaction with people, especially today where so many people are at each other's throats and won't listen to each other, that the more we can build these connections and processes of connections that can bring people to the hmm and a ha stage of thinking differently, but doing it with processes that help them get to know their neighbor or help them to get to know people they don't have a clue as to who they are, and that requires a, that a traditional leader we found can't do that. It has to be a new type of leader that not only philosophically, but from the standpoint of the way in which then you organize and then facilitate has a lot to do with it. Do you see why? I hope you see why I made that connection to your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Rick, just uh, interpolating, do you see organizations changing in that same way? Yes, and Stuart, I think there are times when I, I, I think, for instance, let me use let me use our own organization. Our our, our own organization of communities in the future does not have any IRS designation to it. Doesn't have any structure to it. It is a self organized and we designed it that well when thirteen of us met from North and South Carolina at the coast to think about how do we prepare for a different kind of future. And I have a good friend who, who died about five years, three or four years ago, a guy named Marv Cetron, who was a well-known futurist in the world. And Marv, about 2000, would talk about that he thought that within about 25 or 30 years that, any, that a large organization would only have, uh, uh, would only have at the max 1,500 worldwide organization, would only have about 1,500 people plus or minus 300 
that would be a part of the structure that would be consistent and that and that the rest of the time you would bring in and connect different types of organizations or networks or people that would then move in and out according to what was needed with regard to that organization. So the way in which we had organized ourselves is based on building connections of great people like you and collaborating. And one of the things I've learned is I had to change who I was, a part of who I was, to be willing to be open uh, and to be willing to, in effect, uh, listen differently and then to make suggestions as opposed to giving direction. But the way in which I believe then that we're going to have to organize ourselves is more of a collaborative based on ecosystems and connections. And yet you will still have the pockets of the, of the major organizations that will have traditional structures, but it will have, as opposed to four levels, it will have maybe a level and a half or two levels. Just an opinion. Anyone else? I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the time, but I think we started a few minutes later so we can, we can run over a few minutes. The one comment that I'd like to make is, uh, is uh, an extraordinary transformation. And I appreciate it. That we need more of that, basically. Matt, would you mind giving me a little more of your thinking in that? Well, the fact that you went from uh, what we call the fiat, thinking to more open thinking and stuff like that. Um, not a lot, of, a lot of people, not a lot of people do that on their own. That's, that's all that I'm saying. And you didn't do it on your own. You, you did it slowly dealing with other people and stuff like that. But, um, but anyways, I just think it's, it's, it's not ordinary. It's not the kind of thing that you go, oh yeah, another one that's not. It's not like that. Matt, I had a friend of mine, he doesn't know I know this, here in Gastonia. He, he apparently uh, said to another friend of mine, since I was so involved in local affairs for 20 years, 15, 20 years, he said, it's a real shame that Rick's gone off the deep end. So I want you to know. <laughs> Rick, I want to just really thank you for taking the time today to share your thoughts and ideas uh, as, a, as a noted futurist, I appreciate your, um, your contributions, and um, may we all uh, transform in ways that create a different world in 2045. So um, thank you, Rick. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rick. And you've been doing that ever since I knew you, so keep up the good work. <laughs> and I enjoy talking to all the rest of you and look forward. Any way I can be of help, please get in touch. <laughs>